In the beginning, the Seattle Channel was known as Seattle Municipal Cable TV 28. Run by the Seattle Public Library, its placement in the cable menu made it hard to find. People kind of think of you as this government channel in the 20s and just skip right over you. In theory, when you're not grouped right next to the commercial stations, you probably don't get as many viewers as people are channel surfing. Channel 28 was, was not ideal, but it's what we got, and it was kind of hard to negotiate a change. Hard to find and hard to watch, as the programming at the time was a little dry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Basically, it was uh, meetings just about all meetings. So just covering a meeting almost, almost felt like punishment for some people. The council will come to order. There was a guy named Peter Watson, and he would go up to the council meetings and record them all by himself and play them back on a very boring municipal cable channel. Just very rudimentary programming about anything. Da, 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 da. I mean, it was just so basic that there wasn't much information going out. A lot of people like to recycle. We're gonna be doing a main flushing here. I guess that's about it then. Hard to find, hard to watch, and well, a hard place to work. Located in the municipal building, the equipment was outdated and the facilities lacking. The, the basement in the municipal building was a dungeon-like basement. I think we had 10 feet of space and maybe 20 lengthwise. We would go upstairs to the lobby and just pick up a couple like fake plants and just put them behind the chairs. I mean, we were dealing with this rudimentary studio. Truly a basement. You didn't really feel great about where you were and what you were doing. A shift came in 1997, and it started with a name change. Seattle Municipal Cable Channel 28 became TVC. Um, I think I picked TVC. I thought that was really clever. As in TVSEA for Seattle, and nobody could figure that out. You're seeing the city of Seattle that we're on the sea, at least on the sound, and, um, and like CTV, but people obviously thought it was a maritime channel. <laughs> All kidding aside, TVC's programming was no joke. Is that fair criticism? No, I don't think it's fair criticism. Because? It showed more content, more meetings, and much more locally produced programming. I think the bread and butter of it was meetings, and then we started to expand, like, um, what else can we do that would be interesting to viewers? This is the story of the first black woman elevator inspector. Most of the Denny party relocated to the eastern shores of Elliott Bay the following spring. For History Link, I'm Walt Crowley, with special thanks to TVC. To the mayor and the city council's credit, I feel like they had left me alone. In addition to the meetings, we could do pretty much anything else that had some kind of tangential relationship to the city's mandates. The only time they got upset, I think, was really during the WTO riots. My first day. So I started at TVC on November 30th, 1999. But the riots broke out that day. And it's like, can you get your camera and document the WTO riots? It's like, what? I'm getting tear gassed. You know, that's my first day on the job. And it's like, Ralph, welcome to TVC. We came back to the station and uh, we aired all the footage that we took as if it were a meeting because we thought it was so momentous. Not editorializing it, just uh, here, here's what we saw today. The whole, world is watching. the whole world is watching! The riots gave the world its first real chance to watch TVC. The next one came about a year later. The American Diabetes Association. I was switching the cameras for the city council meeting, and it was like, hey, it looks like the cameras are shaking up there, and the council members are diving under the table. And at that point, it's like, what is this? And it turns out to be the Nisqually earthquake. I didn't even think it was an earthquake. I thought they were just doing some blasting for the new municipal building. We had city council members saying, this meeting is adjourned. Meeting's adjourned. Are you adjourning the meeting tonight? Yes, it's adjourned. Peter's adjourned it. Okay. Peter's adjourned the meeting. Thank you. Ralph had the good idea of duplicating the footage and taking it to all the stations, and it aired all across the world. Despite the attention, city leadership thought the channel was underutilized and wanted even more citizen engagement, especially from an untapped internet audience. 
Mayor Paul Schell and Councilmember Jim Compton formed a commission, and six months later, the next mayor, Greg Nichols, made an announcement. This fall, we're going to combine television and web programming and launch an MSNBC-style service. You're watching the Seattle Channel. That service became the Seattle Channel, which included a revamped website. Once we got the site up and operating and there were videos up that people could access and like a million page views a month, okay, we're on to something here. As soon as things were available online, you know, the streaming piece of it, that is where people really started to tap in and, and see the stuff that we were doing. That stuff became the foundation of Seattle Channel's programming. Shows like City of Go Go, which would eventually become Art Zone. There's a lot of things that matter in this city, and certainly one of them is art and culture. And the Seattle Channel has never wavered in that support. City Inside Out launched that same year. Welcome to City Inside Out, your place for news. We had politicians who kept wanting to be on our program. The claim now is that it's too many rubber stampers. That the I don't think that's true. The monorail authority is a public body. It has to be responsible to the larger public. The best thing for a politician is to be in a debate and nail it. And so our program ended up being the kind of forum that you could go on, and if you were good at that, hit a home run. Hello, I'm Mike James. Welcome to City Stream. This is our first program, so let's take a moment to talk about what we are. City Stream made its debut in 2003. You've got the city, you've got the arts, you've got feature stories. It's Tasha and Joey, the incredible tree climbing dogs. Lighter, newsy kind of things. And Booklust took off in 2004. They were trying to do more arts on the channel, and um, I thought, oh my gosh. Seattle's a, a town of readers, and so doing something that was connected to the library just seemed like a natural thing. It's difficult to write. <laughs> yes. I she wasn't just your ordinary librarian. She had her own uh, action figure doll. These are old shows I did. You probably don't even have tapes anymore, do you? This little engine that could, you know, still in the basement of City Hall, but it's impressive what the channel did early on, what the channel still does. That was our backdrop. I'm proud of that backdrop. Over the years, Seattle Channel became a window into government and a voice for the region, ready for whatever the future may bring. My hairstyle has changed, my skin has changed, I've aged. It's the most amazing gift that I have been given. I'm a lucky cat. We all felt we were building something. I did the best work of my career actually at the Seattle Channel because we were given sufficient time to do it. You know, we had the support to do our best work. I loved it. I loved, I loved the work and, um, and I'm glad that it only flourished more. It was just exciting to start in on some new things and, and work together to, uh, to build something we were all proud of. It was a great thing to lift what had been seen as something that people would never pay attention to and lift it up into the public consciousness and make it a useful tool for citizens. Watch City Street Tuesday nights at 7 on the Seattle Channel or find us anytime online at seattlechannel.org.